All right, so this is session nine in our class for the Forerunner School called Understanding the End Times. And I know we have gone through quite a bit of material. It's, it's a lot of stuff to think through. So if you, if you have your notes, go ahead and open those. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Revelation 17. And, and we're going to really dive into Revelation 17 and uh, 18 in this session. Uh, a couple of things as we get started here. Uh, the title of this message is Session 9, The Seventh Kingdom. And as we said in the last session, is uh, there are two end-time empires, the Seventh Kingdom and then the Eighth Kingdom. And so we're going to look in a lot of detail in the Seventh Kingdom today. And, and again, I just want to emphasize to you, uh, be a good Berean. You know, I'm, I'm talking about Acts 17. Don't just accept what I say. I and mean, I don't mean naturally just be like a debater and resist everything I say, but don't just accept everything I say. I want to encourage you to go like the Bereans. And like if you remember in Acts 17, the Bereans heard Paul teach and the Bereans went back and they studied and they said, okay, Paul is what you're saying. I, I hear what you're saying. I receive what you're saying, but it's what you're saying in scripture. And if you don't see what I'm teaching in scripture, don't receive it. Okay. Because I only want you to believe the scriptures. And so I would much rather you study what I say, challenge it with scripture, and walk away with a different view than just to accept what I say and not challenge it, not study it, and just readily accept it. I think that is a major problem right now in the church, to be, to be honest with you, is we are just, we're, if, if an anointed, I'm not saying I'm anointed, but if some anointed man of God comes up and teaches then we just say, okay, they're anointed, I accept what they say, and we don't really go back to the scriptures and say, is that really what the scriptures teach? So I, I'm, I'm just encouraging you to really go back to the scriptures yourself and become a student of these things. And uh, because it takes study, it takes deep, deep study, contemplation. The uh, book of Revelation is complex. Um, it should not cause division in the body of Christ, uh, but hopefully it will help us to stimulate humble conversation where we can learn and grow together. I don't think anyone on the earth has mastered the book of Revelation. I think we're all learning. And so we all want to remain humble. We all want to remain teachable. We all want to remain, okay, uh, we want to hear from this person or that person and, and just, just listen humbly and see, okay, this is what I think, let it, be, let it sharpen what I think from what you think and that kind of thing. That's what we're kind of getting at here. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, and I think I've said this before, honestly, is one of the most complicated passage, passages of Scripture to me in the Bible, especially if it's in the New Testament. It is, I would say, is probably the most complicated in the New Testament to understand. It's taking me... Uh, 20 years of study to arrive at what I believe this is, is teaching. And that doesn't mean I've studied it every day, but I, I really investigated Revelation 17 and 18 quite a bit, uh, listening to videos, reading books, you know, reading commentaries, all that kind of stuff. It's just something that even in my, even 20 years ago, just fascinated me. Just like, okay, what does this mean? It was, uh, it was such a mystery to me. And so it has fascinated me. I do believe, I, I feel pretty good about my, my, my view in Revelation 17 and 18, I feel, I feel confident about it. I'm not dogmatic. I'm not saying I have every nuance perfectly articulated. But um, anyway, so Revelation 17 and 18 is a very important passage of Scripture. Um, the, the thing I want to emphasize as well from the last session, in Daniel 7.24, just remember that verse, Daniel 7.24, we use that scripture along with some other scriptures to show there's five phases of the seventh and the, and the eighth kingdom being restored at the end of the age. And so Daniel 7.24 said, out of this kingdom, 10 kings would arise. When I read that, that tells me, okay, the iron kingdom is going to be established, and that iron kingdom is going to be established first, then the ten kings come out of it, all right? So that to me tells me there's going to be a revival of the fourth empire or the iron kingdom or what we have said is the revived Roman empire. Many scholars agree with, with that, and many scholars believe that, that there would be a revival of the iron kingdom and I went through and explained why I believe the Iron Kingdom is Rome. And so 
I believe it's a revived Roman Empire that we're seeing in Daniel. And we're, uh, if you look at Revelation 17 and 18, I believe you're seeing the ultimate time of the revived Roman Empire. And so you remember in Daniel chapter 2, we have the iron uh, we have the iron legs, and that, those iron legs uh, form into iron toes mixed with clay, or iron feet, sorry, iron feet mixed with clay, and then iron toes mixed with clay. And so I, I think the, the feet are the uh, seventh kingdom, that iron mixed with clay, that, that merging together, and I mentioned in the last session, that merging together quite possibly of the European world and the Arab world to form a revived Roman Empire. And then the, that's the seventh kingdom, then the eighth kingdom being the ten toes where the ten kings rise up of clay and iron, and that's the Antichrist's final empire. So that's what we talked about in the last session. Um, so as we get into Revelation 17 and 18, it's, uh, we're going we're gonna to read through this in a minute. I always like to know on a map, I'm, I'm so terrible with directions, I'm so really bad. Thank God my wife is perfect, is like the belt, she could be a logistics planner for like a uh, shipping company. I mean, she's like so got every, I mean, she maps out every, like we'll pull into a parking lot and, you know, she'll map out the exit and where I should park and she all knows all these shortcuts and I'm just so directionally challenged. So she's uh, uh, such a blessing. That's not the only reason she's a blessing, but she's a blessing for many, 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 many reasons. But that is one thing that she really helps me in. But I always like to know, okay, on a map, you are here. This is where you are. It helps you locate the place you're at. And so I think if you were to look at that chart we looked at in the last session, phase one, two, three, four, and five, I think between phase one and phase two, that we're seeing the very, very beginning of the empire, Roman Empire being revived through the European Union is only at the beginning. Um, it's definitely not going to be that in its final form. It's at the beginning, I believe. Phase two is you'll see ten kings rise up at some point. But I believe kind of right now we're in between phase one and phase two where, where we're going to see, and we're, that's what we're going to talk about in this session, we're going to see the seventh kingdom rise to power at the end of the age. And so... In Revelation 17, just as a quick review here, in, in uh, Revelation 17, verse 18, I think it's such a, a critical scripture. In fact, having studied Revelation 17 and 18 for, for so many years, this was so hidden from my eyes for many years, many years. And just even, just even within the last year, I would say the Lord has opened my eyes to it. And in fact, I mentioned in one of the last sessions that uh, a guy named P.J. Hanley wrote a book on the end times and pointed out this very scripture to me, and the light bulb just went on, like, wow, that is, I have never, I've read it so many times, I, that never clicked, but I want to read this scripture, Revelation 17 and 18. The woman whom you saw, talking about the harlot riding the beast, is the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. In other words, what's happening there is John comes out of the vision and the angel tells him, the woman, the harlot that you saw riding the beast, I know you have a lot of questions, John, about what she symbolizes and what she represents, but John, I'm telling you the interpretation, the key to interpreting who that woman is, is right here. The woman whom you see is the great city. And so in John's day, there would have been no doubt who that great city was in his mind. That great city was the city of Rome. That great city of Rome is a, is a city that had power and influence over all of the kings of the earth. That city is the one that ruled over the kings of the earth in John's day. And that doesn't mean over every single nation, but over the, a good significant portion of the then known world, Rome had influence and the kings of the earth were bowing their knee, so to speak, to Rome. They were puppets of Rome. And so with that in mind, we're going we're gonna to take a deep dive here in Revelation 17 and 18. And we're going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, what I would say here first is I'm going to start with Re uh, Revelation 17 verse 1. And John's writing, and he says, then, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, this is very important for us 
as students of end time prophecy, as we come to Revelation 17 and 18, it's very important for us to realize what we're seeing in Revelation 17 and 18 is something that has not yet happened. It is a future event. Many times, end time prophecy teachers will make this uh, they'll, they'll, make a, they'll make a mistake where they try to interpret Revelation 17 and 18 as something that is currently in existence. But John is telling us, or rather the angel is telling John, I'm going to show you the judgment of the great harlot. In other words, what the angel is telling John is I'm going to take you into the time period just prior to when this harlot experiences God's judgment. It's a very key verse in interpreting this passage of Scripture. In other words, this has not yet taken place. So in our interpretation, if we try to look at a current situation and say, this describes America or New York City or whatever it would be, the Illuminati or whatever. No, this has not yet taken place. This is, is still into the future. Huge point there as we go through that. Now we come now to uh, verse 2. As the harlot sits on many waters, but it's the kings of the earth. They commit acts of immorality with her. And those who dwell on the earth are made drunk with the wine of her immorality. He carried me away, verse 3, he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman, she was clothed in purple and in scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She had in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And in verse 5, this is where we'll, we'll, uh, end, we'll stop for a second here. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now, what we see here, this woman, she sits on many waters. Well, what we know a few verses down in verse 15 is these waters are symbolic of tongues and people and nations and tribes. This harlot is sitting on many waters. She has worldwide international influence. And so this, this harlot also written on her forehead is the word Babylon the Great. Now, some, some interpreters say... Some people say it's mystery Babylon, but that's, and then they try to make it this weird interpretation, but I, I think it's rather when John saw it, it was a mystery to him. It wasn't mystery Babylon, it was a mystery to him, but he saw Babylon the Great on her forehead. And so what we see here is, is the Lord is, is taking a direct quote from Nebuchadnezzar, when he said, uh, looking at his kingdom, right before he was changed and humbled, when Nebuchadnezzar looked out and he looked out over the patio of his palace and looked out at his kingdom and he says, is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built? And so what the Lord is doing in this vision is he's taking this harlot and he's saying this harlot is a symbolic representation of end time Babylon. And so we can learn about this harlot from associating it from Babylon. One thing we can learn is this, is if you think about the Tower of Babel, you, have, you had Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar's day, but you had many different Babels and Babylons throughout history, but the Tower of Babel led to Babylon eventually, many years later. But the Tower of Babel was a unity movement where the nations that were, were the, I don't want to say the nations, but the people of Babel, of Shinar said, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower which will reach, reach unto heaven. And they had such unity around their purpose and such unity around their vision that God himself had to come in and step in and interrupt and judge what they were doing because the Lord himself said, is, 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 is nothing is impossible for them. And so God had to put an end to the Tower of Babel. But the point is, is when we see Babylon the Great, we can also see this end time revelation of Babylon is going to be moved, is going to be built by a unity movement, a demonically energized unity movement of the nations around the earth. 
In fact, I believe we're beginning to see that now as, as the nations are trying to get into a, a common language, a common laws, common economy, common religion to, to build together not just one city, but a global city, an empire connected around the world, a global one world government, one world religion, and one world empire um, economy. So if you think about this, um, when, when he sees on our head Babylon the Great, he's associating that with Babylon. And so what we know about Babylon, Babylon, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, the gold head and the lion with the eagle's wings in Daniel's visions, what we know about Babylon is it was way more than a false religious movement. Yes, there was great idol, idol worship in Babylon, but it was, and there was definitely a religious element to Babylon, but Babylon was a worldwide government. Babylon was a, an economy. Babylon was a religious system. And so I think what the Lord is telling us, this is more, the harlot is more than just a religious system, though it includes the religious system just by her being a harlot and a golden cup full of abominations and immorality. But it's more than just a religious movement. I believe it's a, it represents a one world government, one world empire, one world economy, religious system. And so that's why I, I, I believe the Lord is emphasizing that here in this particular passage. And what we know as well is Revelation 17.10, this harlot, this city, the city of Rome, this, uh, the, the apex of the revived Roman Empire is going to be in power for a short time. Now that could be a decade, two decades, uh, several decades we don't know, but in comparison to the other kingdoms and the other heads, this kingdom, which I believe is showing us the seventh kingdom, Revelation 17 and 18, I believe is showing us the seventh kingdom, is in power for a short time. It's future and the duration is a short time. So that's what we're seeing here. Now, we're going to dive in here to look at now the one world government, the one world economy, the one world religion of the harlot Babylon. And as we go through this, I'm going to tie into this some possible scenarios of how this might happen using what's taking place through the UN's 2030 agenda, through the, great, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset, through the uh, uh, UN's 17 Goals of Sustainable Development. Now, I'm not saying beyond a shadow of a doubt. I think we've all kind of realized we got to be very careful in making predictions. I think we've seen that over the past in a year or so, we got to be very careful in making predictions. So I'm not making a thus saith the Lord prediction. This is, these different things are going to lead to Revelation 17 and 18 being fulfilled. But I am saying it's something to watch for. I'm saying it's something we should look for, we should look at and say, could this be? Could this be? I think it's a very possible that it could be. Um, but we want to watch for that. We want to watch for that. We want to look at that. So here in... In, John, in uh, Revelation 17, verse 2, and 18, verse 3, John looks at this harlot, and this harlot's riding the beast, but he notices in his, in his vision he sees the kings of the earth are committing fornication with her. Now, this obviously is symbolic. It doesn't mean that the kings of the earth are literally having uh, sex with a harlot that's riding a scarlet beast. It's symbolic. And so what does that mean? It also says a little bit later, they, the kings of the earth lived sensually with her. Well, if you think about this, we think about just, just taking the, the, the imagery of a harlot is what happens if someone is going to use a harlot, they give the harlot money in exchange for money, the harlot gives this person sex. And so in the same kind of, if you take that and you, you interpret it, so what's happening here is the kings of the earth or actually the harlot in this case, who's enormously wealthy because she has the riches of the world at her disposal. And we'll talk about the economy in a minute. The, the harlot with all of this money is giving her money, is giving the, the large sums of money to kings of the earth, leaders, politicians, uh, presidents, kings, technocrats, leaders of government, leaders in industry, for large sums of money the, the harlot is getting in exchange for large sums of money influence over the people that she, over the people that they lead. And so, in other words, what's happening is 
The harlot and her one world government, her laws, her legislation, her rules, her religion, her economy, when, when the kings of the earth are bribed by the, re, the wealth of this harlot, then they then are, are giving the people they have influence over access to this harlot. So now the, the heavy handed fist of the harlot, her legislation, her rules, her economy, her laws, her legislation are now coming into these nations the kings have authority over. And so that's why you see this one world kingdom taking place. So what we see now, and I've got a lot more about this in the notes, but let's just take this for example. Let me just share a real world example of how this possibly could happen and how, what this might actually look like. So if you look on the notes on page two, is you've got the UN 17 goals of sustainable development. And I would encourage every believer out there to really learn about the UN 17 goals of sustainable development and the 2030 agenda. Basically, the 2030 agenda is the time frame that the world's elite with enormous sums of money and power want to have these 17 goals of glo global government established in the earth by 2030. So that's nine years from now. And they are dead set on having that. I think you can interpret many events of 2020 and 2021 through the grid of the elite wanting to establish the UN's 2030 agenda in the next decade. And so this, this is a very real possibility of paving the pathway to global government and the, the fulfillment of Revelation 17 and 18. I'm not going to go through every single one of these goals. I'm going to highlight a few of these, but you can look at them all in your notes. The, the first one I'm going to talk about is goal number one, just to help you understand, okay, what does all this mean? Because you read it as like no poverty, no disease, health care for everyone. We want to make a more sustainable, equitable planet. We want to we bring justice to the world. We, you know, it sounds so utopian, sounds so awesome. You're like, who could even argue with that? You're cold-hearted for thinking that this, there's something wrong with it. But when you actually dig into what it is, it's global socialism, it's corporatism, it's technocracy, it's basically a group of extremely wealthy elites eliminating the middle class, rising up in power, and forcing on them global socialism, forcing on the world global so socialism so that now the inhabitants of global Babylon, so to speak, become serfs in their kingdom where they, this technocracy of elite business people, leaders, politicians become extraordinarily wealthy, extraordinarily pow powerful, uh, where the, the middle class has been eliminated and we are just basically serfs and slaves of this, of this kingdom. And so that's really what they're moving towards. And that's what they're aiming at. When, when you see goal number one, no poverty, that's basically... That basically means global wealth redistribution. And, that, and that's known not, not just in, uh, in a country like America, where if you have global wealth re redistribution, that basically means the wealthy are paying more taxes and the poor get more subsidies and stuff like that. Well, this is more, not only that, but it's more on a national level. So a country like Haiti, a third world country like Haiti, that the, a country like America would be uh, would, would no longer put America first. The, the nationalism of America would no longer be first. And so America would no longer consider the, her own needs first. America would be consider the needs of the world first. So they would take the money of, of the economy of America and distribute it to third world nations like Haiti. So now all the nations become equalized in terms of financial uh, prosperity. And so that's kind of the idea of that. The third goal, good health and well-being. This means basic, this means uh, universal health coverage for every person. This means access to vaccinations, access to doctors, access to abortions. And, you know, Vladimir Lenin said that, that uh, if you want to control, if you want to control society, he said that, that socialized medicine is the keystone of socialism. If you want to control a society, if you want to control the world, it comes through socialized medicine. And so that's basically what this is. It's, it's global universal health coverage for everybody. It's global uh, socialized medicine. The fourth one, 
quality education. That, well, that sounds so great. We want to educate everybody. Well, basically what that means is brainwashing our children to believe what the global state is telling us is right. In other words, their definition of history is what is believed. Their definition of sexual identity, sexual orientation is what is believed. Their definition of uh, social justice, their definition of religion, their definition of all the, all the different agendas is what is, is pushed onto our children. And we have no right to uh, educate our children. That's what they want to do is they want to make, they want to make our children they want to make our children part of the state where the state becomes their father and mother, okay? That ain't going to happen on our watch. <laughs> so that is not acceptable to me as a parent. Absolutely not. That means homeschooling is, is, would be eliminated. So that's kind of the thinking here is this, these global laws pushed down uh, through this one world government. Goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities. That means that basically they want, to move, they want to move society into cities, smart cities, cities driven by technology. In smart cities, they want to have the, what's called the Internet of Things, um, quantum computing, uh, 5G technology that, that is, is basically artificial intelligence. It's, uh, you know, 24-hour surveillance. So basically, everything we do is no longer private. Everything we do is monitored. Everything we do is controlled. And they want to move that into smart cities. That's part of their agenda. Goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. This is basically, I'll just make it real simple. This basically means that we're eating way too much meat. This means that we can no longer have steak, brisket, ribs, chicken, all the stuff we love, especially in the South. I can't imagine them trying to, <laughs> being successful with that down here in Georgia. You know, I'm taking away your ribeye, I'm taking away your steak. I mean, even I saw this week that now they have this thing, 3D printing. I don't even know how this works, but 3D printing that can actually print out an edible ribeye steak. And so I have no idea. I would definitely not eat it, but I don't know how in the world that even works. But, you know, even, even recently, Bill Gates, who's a global elite, is, is pushing for the, uh, that we would no longer eat meat for the sake of the environment, for the sake of climate change, climate control. So basically, that's just an idea. So, so just to help you understand, so just imagine that these 17 goals get implemented and, and there's a one headquarter city that eventually becomes... Uh, eventually becomes Rome, or, you know, just even think about it before it becomes Rome, just this, this global agreement between nations to say these are the, the global laws, the global goals we're trying to implement. And now there's, there's this enormous wealth associated with it because behind all of this is an economy, is a one-world economy. Behind all of this is, is an economy of incredible prosperity and so the kings of the earth who have influence over the people who they lead are being bribed by this economy. Hey, you know, if you allow us to implement this in your, in your nation, we're going to give you 10% of the revenue or whatever, 3% of the revenue, 1% of the revenue. We're going to give you millions and millions of dollars if you give us access to the people you lead and implement it in, in, this, in your nation and allow this to pass in your nation. That's how, in my opinion, the kings of the earth fornicate with the harlot. They allow the harlot's global laws, global government to influence the people they lead, like these 17 goals, what it all means. They're bribed by money. They're bribed by money. So basically what we're seeing in this one world government, in my opinion here, what we're seeing in this one world government is, is some kind of a hybrid here of socialism, corporatism, and technocracy. And a lot of us probably are not familiar with some of those terms, so I'll just kind of just real quickly go over what those are just so we have a, a framework of what it means. But socialism is, is basically a, a, a theory of political economic system that advocates for the means of production, distribution, and exchange, and it's and is regulated in most cases by the state. So the state controls the, the economy, the state controls distribution, services, products, and things like that. I'm sure all of us are somewhat familiar with, with socialism. Corporatism, the way to think of corporatism is to think about the merger of big business, big tech, businesses like AT&T or 
uh, you know, uh, Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft, mergers between these big businesses, these big tech businesses and the state to where this, some have called it corporate fascism, where the, the state and the corporation merge together, this private public union of, of agreement to that where the government says, okay, you're our service provider for technology and you're our service provider for, uh, you know, like Home Depot for home improvement or whatever. You know, it could be this different thing. And in fact, when you look at Revelation 18, I, I see that so clearly when it said, when the Lord points out, your merchants were the great men of the earth. Your merchants were the great men of the earth. In other words, your merchants, the merchants that are tied into this one world economy are the CEOs of these great Fortune 500 companies, not only in America, but internationally, is, is that the merchants are these great men who have enormous wealth, and they increase their wealth even as they join in with this one world economy. Technocracy is basically technocracy. What that means is an elite group of technical experts are leading the charge in how the, how the world should operate. The technocrats are saying, okay, we know better than you do. We know better than you do how health should be operated. We know better than you do how technology should be implemented. We know better than you, and, and you know, we're already seeing some of that right now in the nations, but it's going to increase even more. Technocracy where big tech like Google, Facebook, Apple, all Twitter, all these different companies are saying, you know, we're going to control and regulate free speech. We're going to control and regulate what the population can hear. We're going to, we're going to fashion our algorithms so that the, the truth, only, the only truth we allow to get out is what we want regulated. This technocracy, is, is, I, I see that, that same type thing rising up, um, it, possibly, potentially, in this, in this one world government. Okay, so having said that, let's look now at one world religion. Because the harlot, one of the things about the harlot we see is, is she's a harlot. Harlot, if you know if you're a student of the Bible, you know that harlotry is always symbolic of idol worship in the, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament especially. In fact, you look at the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, and they're often making statements like they, Israel played the harlot with other gods. And so this harlot, this harlot city is absolutely a religious movement. This is absolutely a religious movement. She has a, a gold cup full of abominations. It's, 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 a, it's a false religion, false ideologies, uh, giving the world the ability to have just no moral absolutes while having a little dab of religion to soothe their, their conscience so they don't feel guilty for what they do. A ticket to heaven, by you, but you can live however you want. So this harlot is an idolatrous religious system of spiritual adultery. And so the reason I believe it's a one world religion is because the, the Satan's goal in this harlot, and it's fact, it's, it's revealed in Revelation 17, Satan's goal is to intoxicate the nations. In fact, you see that very clearly. It says that this woman is making the nations drunk with the wine of her immorality. Just like alcohol brings us to this place where we lose sobriety, we lose all sense of reason, and we start doing and acting and, and saying things we would never do, the enemy has a strategy to intoxicate the nations through a false religious movement. And his goal, like I said in the last session, his goal is to weaken the conscience of the nations so they will more readily accept the Antichrist and his, uh, his sole religion and they will bow down to the Antichrist and worship him and worship Satan. So there is, a, there is a satanic strategy in this that the enemy wants to weaken the nation's conscience through the harlot and her wine of immorality, her adulterous system of religion. And I just think, okay, this is why I think it's, it could potentially be a religion that merges together Christianity, Judaism, Islam, potentially even other religions, is because, first of all, in Revelation 18, the Lord says, come out of her, my people. So we know by that statement, I think it's Revelation 18, verse 4, we know by that statement that there are many of God's people, many Christians, 
who are, who are entangled in this false religious system. And so I can't imagine God's true church being entangled in something that was only Islam or only Judaism. I believe it has to have an element of Christianity in it. So that's why I believe that it definitely would include Christianity. Even, uh, even, even if you think about it, the, um, the, the, the fact that this harlot city, which we have said is Rome and the Vatican and the Pope, have been exporting false religion from there for many, for, de- for centuries, for centuries. Again, that, that does not mean there's not true born-again believers in the Catholic Church. There absolutely is. There's, there's I don't know how many, but there is many born-again believers that love Jesus Christ with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength in the Catholic Church. But I'm talking about the system that is, that is exporting uh, heresy, doctrines of demons. You know, Paul said, if anyone preaches another gospel other than the one we have preached, let him be accursed. And you look at some of the doctrines that come out of the Catholic Church, it is absolutely another gospel. It's another Jesus. Again, there are many Catholics in the Catholic Church that are born again and love the Lord with all their heart, but I'm talking about the system. So there's going to be definitely an element of, of Christianity within it. I think also, too, when you think about it, it's going to be the Antichrist who is the head of the seventh kingdom who is going to be instrumental in establishing a covenant between the Jewish world and the Arab world on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount in in Jerusalem that says the Jewish people and the Muslims, the Jews and the Muslims, they basically are worshiping the same God. That's what is going to be preached because the idea behind this one world religion is universalism. Universalism that says, you know, you, you have your way to God, I have my way to God, but at the end of the day, you know, God, it's all leading to the same pathway. Christians think, you know, believe Jesus is the way to God. Muslims believe Allah is the way to God. Uh, or Allah is God. The Muhammad is the, is, has revealed him. Judaism believes it's through Moses. You know, and so, but basically we all believe the same God. All roads lead to the same God. It's just different cultures, different expressions. And, you know, we as Christians know that's an absolute lie. But that's the universalism that's going to be promoted. And you can just imagine, just think about it, is is what is it going to be, what is it going to take to establish temple worship, Levitical sacrificial worship on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in a rebuilt Jewish temple, while right next to that rebuilt temple is a mosque that's worshiping Allah. It's going to take some type of of religious, one world religion that has brainwashed the nations to believe Christian Jews and, and Muslims all worship the same God. That's why I believe it's going to be a merger of Jewish, Jews, or Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. You know, it's, and it, it's going to have, I can just imagine, I, I just imagine it's going to be, just as this goes forward, I, I can imagine they're going to create some kind of holy, unholy Bible that's going to remove out of the, out of the, out of the, it's going to take, say it this way, it's going to take from the scriptures, from the, from our scriptures, the best of the Bible, but it's going to remove the hate speech. It's going to remove anything that's LGBT, against the LGBTQ agenda. It's going to remove anything that says marriage is only between one man and one woman. It's going to definitely remove, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life out of the scriptures. In fact, I think what we're going to see is something kind of like in Nazi Germany when the Germans, they took the Sermon on the Mount and they rewrote it to be a Nazified Sermon on the Mount. And instead of saying, you know, the meek will, I'm not sure, I have to go back and refresh my mind exactly what they said, but it was something like instead of the meek inheriting the earth, it's the strong who will inherit the earth, you know, and they they, they made it, they took the Sermon on the Mount and they rewrote it to apply to Nazi Germany and their extreme form of nationalism. And so even in the, Nazi, even in the days of Hitler, there was a state-run church called the German Church. And there was the Confessing Church, which is the remnant church. And Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was one of the leaders of the Confessing Church. I believe we're going to see that same type thing coming out of this one world religion. A, a state church, a one world religion of universalism, all roads lead to, Christ, all roads re, lead to God, is going gonna, is gonna to be pushed down upon the nations. And you can just imagine, 
just imagine this for a second. Us as Christians who say there is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. You can just imagine the nations are going to look at that and say, you are so bigoted, you are so narrow-minded, you are so intolerant of other religions. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that happened with the LGBTQ movement. It's like if we had a different view, you're, so, you're a homophobe, whatever it would be. Whatever that language would be. And so you can just see the same kind of push that's going to come with universalism. And if you read through, if you read through the book of uh, Paul's epistles, there is coming what he said is the apostasy. An apostasy is coming, a defection, a turning away from Jesus Christ to someone else or something else. And I believe that, that we're, moved, we're living in a time when that great apostasy is beginning to happen, is already happening, but it's going to happen at a much more advanced and a much more uh, widespread level than it's happening right now. It's going to lead to the falling away of many. In fact, Paul said the day of the Lord would not come and the return of Jesus would not come. He said that day would not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. In other words, before the Lord comes back, there is going to be a worldwide apostasy of Christians, of people who love Jesus, right, even right now. It's hard to even fathom. It really is. It's, it's sad. It's a grieving thing to even think about. But many people who once loved the Lord are going to be brainwashed. And we're seeing it right now with some of the way of liberal Christianity, universalism, hyper-grace, all roads lead to God kind of thinking that has already affected the liberal church. And it's going to affect it way more in the future, leading to the apostasy. And so this harlot religion is going to take that current apostasy we've seen, that current falling away we've seen, that current kind of the compromise we see in the church to a whole nother level when it merges together Islam and Christianity and Judaism into one world religion and maybe even codifies it in scripture in a Bible. And this harlot religion is going to offer freedom with no moral absolutes. It's going to give humanistic pleasure seekers liberty to live autonomously while soothing their consciences with a little dab of religion. It's also going to be a false justice movement. Even some of the things we've seen in the social justice movement that's began to happen in America, which is really Marxism. That, they're gonna, this, this one world religion is going to have this element of a false justice movement, but it's, it's going to be working hand in hand with potentially these 17 goals of sustainable development. You know, just, you can just imagine is this religion is going to be the hands and feet, so to speak, <clears throat> the hands and feet, so to speak, of the global government's agenda. Their agenda to eliminate poverty, their, limit, their agenda to bring out equality, their agenda to rid the world of disease and to make the world all a one world utopia. The, this one world religion is going to be the hands and feet, so to speak, of this global government. They're going to raise millions, if not more, uh, dollars to fund and, and ec bring equity and justice into the cry of the poor. I mean, it even almost sounds bad to think, okay, well, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is it's, and I mean, I'm all for equalizing the third world nations. I'm all for, it just depends on how we do it. I'm all for third world nations going into experiencing prosperity, just like we have in the Western world. I'm all for that. But it's just how we do it. And see, you can just imagine, it's going to be this false, uh, this false justice movement. And if you're a Christian and you don't have discernment, you're going to be easily seduced by it. I'm just looking at it right now and seeing the church how easily we're misled by false social justice movements and now don't have the discernment to see the political motivation, the economic motivation behind it. It's going to be way more deceptive as we move to the end of the age. That's why we've got to be very careful what we listen to. Very careful what we listen to. And so i got a lot more about this in the notes, but, you know, from... Just looking at it from a, a human perspective, even Christians are going to look at this and go, this is awesome. This is awesome. The world is uniting together. You know, the world is coming together as God's children. 
And the decade, the, you know, not even the decades, the millennia old world, the thousand years of war over religious conflict, it's now over because God's children, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, we're uniting together, and we realize now we're serving the same God. And, you know, we might see things different, but, in all, you know, it's really it's God's way of reaching out to all of us in our own individualistic way. Yet God will look at it very different. God will look at that, and he'll say, this city, Revelation 18, 2, has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. God's perspective of this is so vastly different from the sympathetic, compassionate, humanistic view we have. And God will say, this is full of demons. So I'm saying, be careful, have discernment in the times we live in. Understand where things are going in this. If you followed Pope Francis, you know he is a big proponent of universalism. In fact, in 2016, Pope Francis released a, a video when he, he had a video of a Christian, a video of a Muslim, a video of a, of a Buddhist and a Jewish man. And they, and they were all saying, I believe in love. I believe in love. And I'm sure you probably have seen it. If not, I would, I would definitely check it out. I believe in love. And the subtle message was, if you, don't, if you believe your religion is the only way to God, then you're a bigot. Then you're, then you're just full of arrogance, that your way is right. And how could all these other people be wrong? And so Pope Francis is pushing universalism. And this is how you can kind of see the, this, this woman, Rome, rising up with false religion, is this push towards universalism. And so even in 2019, the Pope got together with one of the leading, the, one of the leaders of uh, the Muslim world, and they created a document. They wrote a document called a document on a human fraternity for world peace and living together. If you read through that document, they basically use the name of God interchangeably for the God of the Bible and Allah. And they're basically saying, this is what this document claims, that pluralism and the diversity of religions evident in the world were intentionally willed by God. In other words, all roads lead to the same God. And if anyone or if any person uh, or if anyone states a person must adhere to certain religion, this idea should be rejected since in their minds God has different ways to worship him for different people, nationalities, and culture. That is absolutely laying the groundwork for a one world religion. And you can imagine Christians who hold to the clear teachings of Scripture and say that is an idol, that is a lie, that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, that marriage is between one man and one woman, and hold to the teachings of Scripture, you can just imagine the persecution that's going to come upon the church through this harlot religion where they're going to identify and marginalize and criminalize those who don't those who stand against what this one world state run religion is teaching. That's why we must be bold and we cannot, be, we cannot have fear. We must be courageous for the hour that's coming and not be timid. We must stand up and courage and say what this is, is false religion, is idolatry, is, is idol worship, is false, is lies. We must be bold in our, in our preaching. We must be bold in the truth. We've got to be that, church. We've got to be that. One world economy. Now we'll look at the one world economy. Not only is the harlot Babylon a one world government, not only is the harlot Babylon a one world religion, but, it, but really what is driving all of this is her one world economic system. The love of money is the root of all evil. At the very heart of this global, this three-quartered strand of government, this three-quartered strand of uh, one world utopia, at the very heart of it is the economic system. In fact, it's so important, John devotes an entire chapter, Revelation 18, describing the wealth that's coming at the end of the age through Harlot Babylon. 
The wealth is so enormous. It's unlike anything we've ever seen that when, when, when this city is burned by the Antichrist and the Ten Kings, they, everyone around the nations goes, such great wealth is laid waste in one hour. The wealth, the prosperity that's coming is going to be unlike anything we have ever seen. I do believe that many third world nations are going to prosper through this harlot Babylon economic system. I believe there will be equality that will be established. We, but we've got to understand what it's ultimately leading to. We've got to understand where this is going. But it's going to be this, I believe it's going to be the economic engine that is going to unite the governments of the earth to say, we want to be part of end time Babylon. You know, we're right now in phase one, so to speak, in that chart I drew where the, the Roman Empire is being revived. Then phase two, there's ten kings that rise up. I believe through this one world economic system that you're going to see many more nations want to align with this. Many more kings, many more presidents and, and prime ministers and leaders of businesses and leaders of corporations and leaders of sports and all these kind of different things that are going to say, we want to be part, we want to, we want a part of the pie because we see this economic system is going to places that we can never even imagine. And, and you know that this harlot city is going to experience unprecedented wealth. That's why she's clothed with purple and scarlet and adorned with precious gold and stones and pearls. The, the incredible wealth that she will experience um, is, is unlike anything we've ever seen. You know, the merchant says in Revelation 18.3, the merchants of the earth who are the great men of the earth, they become wealthy by her sensuality. They become rich by her. And so... They live sensually with her. And it's, you know, and, and I, think, I think just to give you some idea of some things that are happening, what could potentially happen. I'm just going to, again, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord this is going to happen. I'm just saying potentially we're witnessing the rise of a one world economy right now. 2020, 2021, what is called the Great Reset. And, and so you're pro you, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not, but... The World Economic Forum, led up in Davos, Switzerland, is wanting to weaponize the COVID-19 pandemic to build back better. They're wanting to, they're, they're using this pandemic to say, okay, now this pandemic has come, it's time to build back better. What they really want to do is they want to change the, the current capitalistic system with the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency of the world. They want to weaken America and unfortunately, many, many American leaders want to weaken America, want to remove us from being a nationalistic nation to be more globalistic in our focus, is they want to merge together the, the corporate world with the governmental world to create what they are calling inclusive capitalism or uh, stakeholder capitalism, which may, basically means we want to take we want to take the money that, that is generated in a capitalistic system. We still want a capitalistic system, but we want to distribute the wealth to those who don't have much in third world nations. Now, again, that sounds so great, but we know it's basically uh, socialism. It's basically socialism. And so we're seeing this right now is the great reset. They want to get rid of the American dollar and the strength of the American dollar to bring in a great reset. You can do some research. Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, you, you probably may have heard what he said right a, a few months ago, is he wants to use this pandemic to bring about the accomplishing of the 2030 agenda and the 17 goals of sustainable development. Basically, what they want to do, the Great Reset, is they want to, they, the Great Reset is basically the economic engine that's going to help the UN and the global government accomplish the 2030 agenda and the 17 goals of sustainable development. So anytime you see the phrase, build back better, and it's kind of becoming prominent, even Joe Biden used that in his campaign, we want to build back better, basically what they're pushing for is the Great Reset. And our government right now in America is on board absolutely with the Great Reset. And so I believe that's what we're, we're going to witness. We're witnessing the rise of the Great Reset right now. What it ultimately looks like, whether it ultimately fulfills Revelation 18, time will tell. But it's moving in that direction. It's moving right now 
in that direction. E even into the end of uh, December 2020, the World Economic Forum on their website, they have since changed it, but in, in 2020, they had on their website this article called Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, I have no privacy, and life has never been better. <laughs> I mean, think about the brainwashing they're trying to push on us. Life has never been better. You're going to own nothing. I have no privacy, but I've never been happier in my life. You can't eat meat. Everything you want, you've got to rent. It's delivered to you by a drone. You don't even, you don't even own your house. You don't own any, any furniture in your house. And you know, they, they've gone back and they've changed it. But that's where they're pushing towards. That's what they're pushing towards, is they want to eliminate private property. They want to bring in a universal income for all. They want to eliminate the middle class and raise up the elite. And uh, perhaps you've seen their, their video in 2016. In this little video, they said, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Okay? And they have this, they have this guy on there smiling. It looks like he's a supermodel. He looks so happy. Instead of purchasing whatever, instead of purchasing... Whatever you want, you'll rent, and it will be delivered to you by a drone. The, the, uh, they also said that the U.S. Does, will not be the world's leading superpower because there's going to be a handful of countries like China that will dominate. And finally, if you're a meat lover, they boldly declare you're going to eat much less meat for the sake of the environment. <laughs> so we're seeing that right now. That is their agenda, and we are in a clash right now in America, between national sovereignty and globalism. Throw in a little Marxism. So this, this is definitely rising up in this day we live in. How it ultimately works out, time will tell. So at the end of 2020, I, I would encourage you to look into this, Pope Francis not only is promoting uh, one world religion universalism, but Pope Francis is also promoting inclusive capitalism um, I mentioned that earlier, but you should look into this, is Pope Francis at the end of 2020, you, you can see, okay, this may not be that when it talk, comes to Revelation 17 and 18. It might not be the ultimate fulfillment of Revelation 17 and 18, but it certainly is moving towards that. And at least it gives us an idea. This is what this looks like when Rome, the Vatican, the Pope is pushing for a global economy because you can kind of get a picture of Revelation 17 and 18 unfolding. And so in at the end of 2020, the, the Vatican uh, brought together many leading corporations like BP and DuPont, Johnson & Johnson, the Rockefeller Foundation, many different corporations. And they said, we want to establish inclusive capitalism. And what that basically means is they want to harness the, 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 uh, and the, what they said is we want to harness the potential of the private sector to create a more inclusive, sustainable, and trusted form of capitalism. It's basically inclusive capitalism. And so um, the Pope partnered together with one of the Rothschilds, and they, they said we want, to, we want to respond through an economy that responds to the Pope's cry of the earth and cry, or the Pope's call to hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And I, the idea basically is so often capitalism has created enormous wealth for those at the top, but other third world nations don't benefit. And so we want to redistribute the wealth from the prosperous nations. They would still be wealthy, but we want to make them a little less wealthy so third world nations can be blessed. That's, that's what they're moving towards. Again, it almost sounds bad to even be not in favor of that, but you know if you've studied socialism and understand where socialism goes, it never ends well. It never ends well. And so that, that's kind of, you can kind of see, okay, this potentially is how we could get from here to there is through the UN's 2030 agenda, the Great Reset, and uh, inclusive capitalism. Um, I'll make one final point before we close, is I believe that the seventh kingdom, it'll be during the time of Revelation 17 and 18, when it is established in the earth, is we will, th this seventh kingdom is going to help establish a global digital economy. We're gonna, the seventh kingdom will definitely move toward a cashless society where everything is digital, it's global. And the reason I say that is you think about the, the Antichrist in Revelation 13, when he becomes the sole power or the sole dictator of the nations, he's given authority for 42 months or three and a half years. 
that almost immediately when he comes to power, he implements the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, like I said in the last session, is not a vaccine. The mark of the beast is not, uh, uh, you, know, it's, you know, you're not going to accidentally take the mark of the beast because you, you know, you got a, I don't know, an RFD chip on your finger or something like that. The mark of the beast is going to be you pledging your allegiance to the worship of the Antichrist. And so, but what, what we see in Revelation 13 is almost as if the Antichrist flips the switch, so to speak, and almost instantaneously this global digital economy is established. And, you know, I, I've worked in the IT world for 20 plus years, 25 plus years, and I know one thing about software. You do not roll out software uh, in, in like... 30 days, I mean, it's especially if you're rolling out on an international level, it takes years and years for that software to be rolled out around the world, and especially with all the bugs that have to be worked out and all the kinks that have to be you know, worked through. So my point is, it's going to be, it's, it's happening right now, but the seventh kingdom is going to roll out a global digital economy. What we see in Revelation 18 of the one world economy is going to be a digital economy, a global digital economy that the Antichrist in Revelation 13 is going to seize upon and capture when he wages war against uh, Rome in Revelation 17 and destroys her by fire. He's going to seize that global digital economy and then he's going to use it to implement the mark of the beast. He's going to flip the switch because it's already going to be established. Okay, so just we're going to summarize just real quick. Page 8 in your notes is you see phase 1, the Roman Empire revived, which I believe is the European Union. It's beginning to happen. Phase 2, 10 kings rise up in international power. The you are here marker would be between phase 1 and phase 2 in my opinion. And I believe it's through something like the Great Reset, something like inclusive capitalism, something like a one world religion, something like... Um, the UN 17 goals and 2030 agenda, something like that is going to move us from phase one to phase two, and it's going to bring many more nations into alignment with this global government. Then that'll be phase two. Phase three is the Antichrist will emerge onto the scene as an international leader. And you see here in phase three is you see the harlot Babylon, that, that city of cities rising up to prominence and power and then at phase three, when the Antichrist becomes the king of the seventh kingdom, however that all looks and whatever it looks like, he's going to take the city, uh, the harlot city Babylon, Rome, he's going to take that city to great prominence. And then at phase four, the ten kings, when they come to power with the Antichrist, they're going to destroy that harlot city and they're going to establish the eighth kingdom for three and a half years and then finally, phase five, the Antichrist is going to subdue three kings. So that is a mouthful. It is a mouthful. I, I really encourage you, get the notes, study the notes, read through it. If you have to listen to the message over and over, you know, just listen to it over and over again. This is rising up even as we speak. Babylon is rising up in the earth. We have to understand that, church is Babylon is rising up. End time Babylon right now is rising up. And it, there is a real attack against national sovereignty. We're seeing that in America. We're seeing that in Europe. We're seeing that in many other nations. An attack against national sovereignty. You know, in the previous administration in America, Make America Great Again was the campaign. And when Biden got elected, Biden said that we're no longer going to be America first. Well, the reason is because he's a globalist and he wants to push a globalist agenda. He wants to push for this, this great reset. So we're really witnessing right now the rising up of Revelation 17 and 18. So I'll end with this. If you're a Christian and you're part of the church of Jesus Christ, now's a good time to wake up. Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you agree? Now's the time to really wake up to the hour of history we live in. Amen.